Uh, welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar series. We have an exciting talk, an exciting guest for today. We're happy, uh, uh, and I would say long anticipated uh, talk, uh, as I've heard from many. And sorry for the students for scheduling it during final exams. Uh, accept my our apologies. Uh, and in and, and today's webinar, uh, it's organized by Sadaya KFUPM Joint Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, we'll be talking, uh, or our guests will be talking about larger language models for uh, 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 practical or real applications. Um, I believe our uh, speaker today does not need introduction. Anybody with uh, a relevant background in AI have probably stumbled upon his well-known and famous AI ML uh, blog, including myself and many of the researchers that I spoke uh, with here. Uh, 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 Mr. J. L. Ammar has helped millions, I would say, of researchers and engineers to understand machine learning through visual aid and based on and, and different concepts in, in AI and machine learning uh, through the, the well-known blog. Uh, most of what the pieces that he has written, they ended up in, in, in documentation in different uh, libraries that you probably uh, have used uh, or will, will, will use. Uh, Jay is also a co-creator of a popular machine learning and uh, natural language processing course that you've probably seen in Udacity. Um, as I mentioned, um, the introduction is not needed. Uh, most of you know him and you just say, uh, please get him the mic, let him get started. So Jay, the floor is all yours. Please share your screen and get started. That is so kind. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction, uh, Victor Montez. It's great to be here with uh, with all of you uh, speaking about a topic that truly excites me. And if you're following what's uh, exciting people out there about, uh, you know, what GPT models keep doing, um, then you're in the right place. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit about my favorite topic in all of, all of computing, uh, large language models. Uh, this is a little bit relevant for for Google because if you go and search uh, somewhere on Google, you let's say you want to learn how Siri works. What how is the technology inside of Siri? So you search for Siri, and then your keyboard or even the browser he will give you a couple of recommendations of just continuing uh, your typing. Um, and then Google would give you this answer uh, a lot of the times, just this um, small, let's say, snippet of text that is an answer to the query that you search for. And sometimes when you click on the page, it even highlights on the page where uh, the most relevant parts of the text are for you. And I ask people, you know, well, this is something that all of us have, have been through and, you know, what kinds of, uh, which of these um steps included using a language model or used uh, language processing. Um, and um, a lot of the times, some people say one, some people say two, some people say three, but it's usually, it's a bit of a trick question in that it's uh, it's all of these and, uh, and more. So all of these use language models and um, natural language processing technology to get all of these information. But also even more important is the step in the middle between one and two, which is how Google actually retrieved um, the most relevant results. Um, these tasks have names in NLP. So you have auto-completion or predicting the next word. You have semantic search or neural search, uh, which is how uh, one of the ways of finding the right documents for your search query. Uh, text summarization is another one. That's the task that leads to a, a snippet kind of like this. Um, and then question answering is this uh, NLP task where you have a a piece of text and a question, and then you have an answer. Um, and the model is able to sort of um, uh, quote where, where the answer is. If you use Gmail as well, um, you have these suggested responses at the bottom. That's an NLP task called response selection. So there are so many different NLP tasks. You can spend tens of years just um, going over the, the different types of, of language processing uh, tasks that can be done with, um, with language models. But it, it even gets even more interesting if you uh, use other modalities, just more than text. So if you add images or computer vision or audio in addition to text, um, this is... Image captioning um, is one of these tasks that uses both images and, and text. And these are software 
uh, programs that you give an image to, and they, they, they'll write a description of this. And this is from a paper in 2015. Um, and when I see this, I had been a programmer for you know about 15 years when this sort of came out. And it, to me, as a software person, this felt like magic. Um, like anybody who's had to uh, you know double check, do a you know regular expression to check is this email format correct or not, uh, knows that you know having software do things like this um, is, is is absolutely magical. But uh, this was 2015. Um, this is where the state of the art is um, at, as of um, this year. So this is another model. Uh, it does image captioning as well. So this is DeepMind's Flamingo. And uh, it can look at this picture and give you this uh, caption. It says, this is a picture of Barack Obama. He is the former president of the United States. Um, but there is something subtle happening here in this picture. And the the, the Big question here is, can the model pick up on it or not? I don't know if you notice it right away. Um, I definitely had to um, look at this example to really understand what's going on here. So this model is a language model. It's a kind of like a GPT type model that can also look at images. So not just text, but also uh, you can give it images and can have a conversation with you about the images. So after it gives us the caption, we can ask it a question. So how many people in the picture? The model says there are five people in this picture. When was this picture taken? The model says it was taken in a school. Um, and then we ask, how, uh, what is the person standing on? And the model says the person is standing on a rug, which is wrong. The person is standing on a scale. So here we tell the model, he is standing on a, on a scale. The model says, I think you are right. And then here, now we're trying to show the, the, the subtle thing, that the, the, the thing that is very is a little hard to pick up on what's happening on the picture here. So the question is, what is he doing? And the model says he's looking at the scale. The question is, um, where is Obama's foot positioned? Uh, the answer is Obama's foot is positioned on the right side of the scale. What happens as a result? The, the scale shows a higher weight. And then we ask, we tell the model, is the person on the scale aware of it? The model says, I think he's not aware of it. Uh, do you think that is why people are laughing? The model says, I think so. So this shows you a little bit of the, the development that happened over these, these seven years of uh, how uh, rapid developments in language understanding and language generation are like leading to, to software that can do things that are exceedingly surprising. And this happens in LP so much. So I've been following NLP very closely for maybe about seven years now. And like every year or two or six months or, or two months, you have some really surprising development. Um, image generation is another one. This was a, a massive thing this year. Um, so the, here, this is where you have models that you give a piece of text to and they generate the, the, the image. And so you, you tell the model, give me a a picture of Kermit the Frog in Star Wars and gives you this picture. Uh, you tell it, okay, give me a still of uh, Kermit the Frog in Blade Runner and it gives you this picture, which matches the aesthetic of the film. And this is the, this model was not trained to do this specifically. It was trained on a different task. It was not trained with Kermit the Frog specifically or film specifically, but then you have this uh, emergent behavior out of these massive models that are trained on on on, on uh, large amounts of data, and this is kind of the frog in the matrix. You can see sort of how the lighting is dramatic. It's from the top down. The like the design choices, uh, the, the 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 fashion sense. But even if you give it an anime, uh, just the name of the anime, it will match that style. And so this is um, kind of the frog in in Spirit of the Way, which is a a famous anime film movie. So. And these things find their way directly into, into products. So these are not, um, not research only. Machine learning is an area where research and, and, and product and commercialization are very tightly connected. So you can, sign, you can find a paper that is released today, and then you can find it implemented in a product next week. Um, and so if you search your Google Photos for... Um, here, this is my favorite coffee shop in Riyadh, Elixir Bun. If you search for Elixir, it did OCR and retrieved these images that have this word in them. Um, but also if you search for cat, there is no OCR here. There's no word of cat sort of appearing in the image, but there's a classification that happened on the on the image where there's a an image classification that says, okay, what are the things that are in this picture? There is a cat and then 
the product used that word as a entry in the to to index these these image, images. Um, so all of this finds its way directly either as 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 features of existing products or as new completely new categories of um, uh, of models. Um, there's this one. Um, there's a you know a bunch of the examples from products that people use in in everyday lives, but there are new, even new um, categories of products, kind of like companies like Jasper or Copy AI, companies that are built on text generation models. This is the the latest capability that we didn't really have software that is able to generate text um, that is very convincing. Um, another. Uh, go ahead. We have a, uh, and I'm happy to take questions while we while we talk. So that's uh, completely welcome. Um, um, sh sure, sure. We we are usually asked to use the Q and A and then answer them at the end. But okay. uh, let's let's see, Mohammed, uh, uh, for now, if you allow me uh, to allow him to talk. Mohammed, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, what 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 um, what did you mean by um, that you haven't seen a real text uh, message or auto that that that's up for the task? Can you just elaborate on that? And can you also mention that I use Arabic as well. I've, I've been using this for a very long time, and and, and I can tell you that um, um, uh, protocols used maybe affect in what country you're using, and this is from a ten years experience. And I've, I've joined the wave since the first time, and I'm I don't text anymore. I use voice uh, for both Arabic and English, and people are surprised sometimes to see me that. And it worked for me very fine. Of course, sometimes I have to go back and fix some stuff. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Okay. But can you clarify the first question? I don't know that I sort of got it exactly. Yes, uh, sorry, you, you, you mentioned something about uh, you haven't seen a program that actually is it's up for the task. What did you mean by that? Um, not sure sort of which, uh, point that was, uh, that was in. So, uh, the text detecting thing, the text, uh, audio or text, uh, the last, the last slide you were on. Okay. Yeah. So no, I was just saying, you know, an example of, you know, there are so many different, um, like the whole point of this section, uh, is to say that there's a lot of NLP tasks out there. A lot of them are finding their way directly into products, into commercializations, uh, in, and into industry. Uh, and they are in products that you have already used. Uh, so these are widely used, very quickly coming into, into the market, into, into industry. And you mentioned one example that is sort of relevant, which is um, voice and sort of how language and voice, um, you know, there are a couple of examples here in that, but that's also another one area that is uh, absolutely exciting and there's you know tremendous development happening there um in both text to speech but also speech to text um and some of it happening you know around around the kvpm area as well with uh you know fine-tuned whisper models that do um arabic uh, audio to text um really well so that's yeah that's absolutely completely agree that that's an, an interesting um area another interesting area is search and this is probably one of the most massive opportunities out there um in 2019 this or 18 this paper uh, from google came out called uh, with a model called bert um and not six or you know eight months later google search um you know wrote this blog post saying that they um actually use it to power every uh, english language uh, query. Uh, and then a year later, they extended that to, to other languages as well. And they called it, you know, the biggest leap for one of the biggest leaps forward in the history of search. Uh, so this is how language models, these are these, these massive NLP models trained on large amounts of, of, of text um, are able to even empower products like Google search, which, you know, 20 years of the, you know, some of the best programmers and most uh, data available in the world, these new models are also, you know, are becoming game changers here. And, you know, since this, you've seen a lot of the recent, if you're following what's happening in the last few weeks of, you know, can GPT models do better search than even Google search? And sort of that conversation is happening. 
um, even though it's not, you know, we're not completely there yet with these models. They're not necessarily built for that, but we know of ways to make them better. Um, so uh, just a, a quick introduction. I, you know, have a NLP blog. You can just uh, search my name. This is maybe the most popular post on it uh, called the Illustrated Transformer. It's about this architecture of a neural network of machine learning models that is empowering a lot of the, the rise of um, what NLP models are able to do recently. And I try to explain some of the concepts as I learn them. So a lot of these I take as notes as I'm trying to learn a new concept. Um, so, you know, there's a, a YouTube channel with some of these explanations as well. The latest thing I've wrote about is about stable diffusion and how these images are generated uh, and how language models sort of uh, fit into that. I work in a company called Cohere, which is making NLP part of every developer's toolkit. So Cohere trains massive language models and offers them via API. Uh, and I get to work with the developer community and um, you know enterprise customers to um, advise them on how these models can best sort of serve their, their business use cases. We see a lot of different use cases. We see things like content moderation. Uh, we see customer service and how to automate and augment customer service uh, tasks, how you can make computer systems, you know, automatically tag, tag images, uh, automatically tag messages, let's say from customers, um, classify them by sentiment or by topic um, to make the systems of, of, uh, of a company uh, smarter. Um, so three high level uh, use cases for uh, language models that uh, I'm going to be happy to be discussing today is one is classifiers, uh, two is this idea of semantic search or neural search, uh, and the third one is GPT models, which are these text generation models uh, that can um, generate text that is super impressive. Um, and ex more and more getting more useful. Um, so let's start with classification. Classification basically is this idea that, you know, you it's this software system that you give a piece of text and it will say, okay, this text belongs to type A or type B, class A or class B. And the system then can do something else uh, based on what class uh, that is. When I was learning text classifiers, I had wanted... Uh, to see a lot of examples of like, you know, what kinds of text classifiers are out there? What are people classifying their text into? Um, and there are so many different things, but, you know, they, it, this is a quick slide with, you know, a lot of uh, examples. So you see a lot of sentiment, and this is the most, you know, famous one of, you know, positive, negative, neutral. So this is, you know, are customers happy about our product uh, when they mention our company on Twitter? Is that tweet uh, saying something positive or negative? Uh, that's the same thing about reviews on the App Store or something. That's one of the first sort of areas. It's it's much more used in, let's say, in educating people about language. It, there are some applications of it uh, in, in industry, but it's not as, uh, uh, let's say, as, as useful as uh, a lot of these other ones. So, but you, see, you do see a lot of topic classification. Uh, for automatically, let's say, tagging messages or, 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 or documents, um, maybe routing them to the right place. Um, and then another version of that is that, you know, a message or an email or a piece of text can have more than one class, and that's what's called a multi-label classifier. Spam classification by content is, uh, is, is, is also uh, another example. Uh, toxicity of text. So this is content moderation. So if you have messages uh, which contain, uh, you know, toxic behavior or like bullying. Um, you know, a lot of kids are playing video games now with chat. Uh, are people saying things that are inappropriate in chat? These are all very important um, situations to deal with and to, to, you know, try to use these technologies to help us uh, sort of make online spaces uh, safer. Um, and then there's this idea of chatbots. Uh, so chatbots, as they exist now, they break down into two NLP tasks. One of them is intent classification, which is when you get a few, um, one or more messages from a customer, the, your software will uh, try to predict, uh, okay, what is the intent of this user? Is, is this user just saying hi? Is the user asking about our shipping policy? Is the user... Um, unhappy with their product and they want to uh, return it or exchange it, 
Um, so that's you know one of the main uh, uses for, for for classification out there. Um, computers deal with numbers, um, even when dealing with language, uh, they have to represent. Uh, words and let's say text in in language in 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 numbers um traditionally so the way that this file is stored on my computer or like any data is is stored on on your phones or your computers is uh, is unicode uh, so that's how the files are so if you have this sentence how is it going um it's just basically translated into these numbers and that's how it's saved to disk and uh, this representation is good if you for for some of these tasks. So um, you know when you want to see how many characters are in a in a piece of text, or is there an uppercase or lowercase? Is there a number? It's good for that, but it's not good if you want to say, okay, are these two sentences similar or not? Um, or this is a long text. Give me a summary of it, um, or give me a translation of this Arabic uh, sentence. Give me an English translation or a French translation. Th this representation is not very meaningful because the numbers only say what is what we what letter each um, what yeah what letter is uh, um, is represented. It has says nothing about the meaning of the words, and so. Language models have been developing um, with a new, a different kind of numeric representation uh, that captures meaning, and that is called a vector um, or embedding. Um, and in this uh, scenario, when we're talking about text, we can say, okay, we can, um, a, an embedding language model can give us a list of numbers. So we can give it a piece of text, we give it a message or an email, or, and it will give us a list of numbers, let's say a thousand numbers here, and these numbers capture the meaning um, of this of this um, of this piece of text, and then that enables us to build uh, other systems uh, that can you know do interesting things based on on, on the name, including classifying it. Um, so if we have these three sentences, so how is it going? When do you open? So this is, for example, a question that somebody is asking a a store, um, or hi, how are you? Um, we can compare the vectors. We have the software tools to compare these vectors um, and have uh, a score of how similar they are. And that enables software to do smarter things with, uh, with text. And we can also plot and visualize uh, text uh, kind of like this way. And uh, this way we'll see that sentences that are about similar uh, topics will tend to be close to each other. Um, so these are, you know, questions about opening hours or closing hours or opening on the weekend. These questions would be close to, to each other, but far from other questions that are about, uh, you know, pricing or about uh, delivery or, or, or takeout. If you have a, a background in machine learning, um, you might understand the classification as something that kind of looks like this, where you have a text, then you extract numeric features from it. Um, and then those features you train a classifier on. Uh, traditionally, a lot of this in the Python ecosystem is dealt with with scikit-learn, and, and that's one way where we can also train classifiers. I'm not going to get you know too detailed in the in the um, classification here, but uh, into the let's, uh, the technical details here. But um, just to say that you know with language models we can do something very similar, which is we, we just you know use them for feature extraction and just replace this first part. So that's one way of, of, of doing it. Um, the idea of embeddings is, uh, this is one way of visualizing it. So if we have, uh, you know, five sentences, uh, sentences that are similar will be, you know, closer each other to, to each other. So these are, you know, questions about shipping. Um, you find them sort of close to each other. Uh, that's an idea called semantic similarity, which is just to say that the meanings are similar, you know, regardless if they use the same words or not. Um, and we can we can do different things with um, fine tuning, but that's let's say a more advanced uh, uh, topic. But fine tuning is this idea that you you can train it a model that is already trained, and we can train it a little bit more, and that is usually what gives us the best possible classifier out there. Um, 
and so that's that's the end of the section on 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 classification. Uh, it's one of the three major topics. The second one is this idea of neural search or semantic search, um, which builds on top of it. So if if you just have a sense or an intuition about uh, what we just uh, showed about similarity and you know our ability to compare that this sentence is similar to this one and far from that one, that's basically what we're doing here. Um, Two main ways uh, to do a semantic search is a little bit technical. So if, if this doesn't make sense, you can, uh, you know, that, 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 that's okay. But, you know, two major uh, applications. We'll be talking about the one on the right, which, called, which is called dense retrieval, which is just comparing the embeddings of the, So if you have a query, you embed it, uh, and then you have, uh, you compare that embedding to all of the embeddings of your archive. So all of your uh, text documents uh, that you have in your archive. So that's one way uh, that is maybe you know, more commonly used, but the one that was, I, we believe, uh, you know, used more in that initial Google blog post is this idea of re-ranking, where you use the old um, keys, keyword uh, search technologies, uh, this algorithm called BM25, to get you a thousand results, and then you use, you know, a language model to just reorder these thousand, um, and, and so that reordering uh, tends to improve uh, that, that search quality very much. If you're interested to go deeper, this is a book that goes, uh, you know, uh, a lot deeper into these ideas of uh, um, using these transformer lang uh, language models for, for text ranking and retrieval and search. How it comes to um, products, um, this is, let's say, a simple example. So let's say you have a, a customer that sends a question you can compare that question to existing questions in your frequently asked questions. And if one of them is very close, then your system can say, okay, I know that the answer to that question and your system can send that answer back out to, to the user. That's the, you know, one of the basic um, uh, intuitions of how to use that in a product today. Um, there are a few uh, code examples here that you can follow. So if you can go to Cohere AI slash notebooks, uh, you'll be able to access these um, and look at, uh, at these examples. I'm not gonna, you know, the specific code is not important, but you have access to it. Uh, but I'll just show you a quick um, demo of this idea of, of neural search or semantic search, where the idea is, you know, kind of like it, it is visualized here. So you have a text archive, of text and its embeddings. Whenever you have a new query, you embed it, you compare using a search engine, and then you get your search results. Um, a quick look here of how to do that. So let's say we get a, this data set of questions. So these are, um, you know, a thousand questions. Um, and basically here, the exact code used here, you can use this to use to, um, you know, build something like Stack Overflow's similar questions feature. Uh, so we have all of these questions, we send them to a embedding or representation uh, language model and we get the embeddings. So these are a thousand questions. Each question is uh, represented in 4,000 numbers that capture its meaning. And then we can do something interesting with it. So we can uh, store it in a search um, uh, database and then we can start searching. So let's say we have this query, we say, what are bear and bull markets? Um, and then the search um, library will give us this these results. So what animals do you find in the stock market? And so these are references to bear markets and bull markets, which are financial terms, right? Uh, what do uh, economists do? What are equity securities? So these are all about the stock market. Uh, so the similarity here, even if they don't use the same sort of words, the meaning is, 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 is similar. And so um, this is a, a very simple uh, example, and you know this is one of the areas that um, you know we anticipate is is going to be, be massive in um, in industry and empowering products um, in, in all languages. Uh, so this is the quick look at uh, at uh, semantic search, um, and we can use it for visualization as well. Uh, the last and third one, and then we can have a, a Q and A and go deeper into any of these topics, is this idea of text generation. Uh, so, only in let's say 2019 did we start to have these software GPT models that can write 
an article uh, that you don't know was this written by a human or by a computer. Um, and that ability has been only continuing to, to develop and be more and more impressive over time. And text generation can be, it's not just one task, it's a lot of different tasks. So you can use generation for summarization. You can use it for paraphrasing. You can use it for extraction. You can also use it for, if you're training a coding model, you can use it to have your model explain your code or suggest some code for you. Uh, you can use it to write stories or do, do other things. So generation, let's say is one word, but it captures um, a lot of different things. Um, and generation also can do classification. And this is one of the really surprising um, realizations of the last you know, few years that if you train models that are large enough on, on large enough data, they can try, they can uh, do this idea of few shot uh, classification. So you can show them you know, five examples of, of uh, something you want classified and they're able to pick up on it a lot of the times. Uh, and so that is, you know, very interesting. And that idea developed a new um, form of engineering called prompt engineering. So there's a new programming or uh, paradigm of writing software, but you're not writing software, you're just writing text. Uh, and the text uh, the, is input to a language model and you have it do something interesting for you uh, or useful. We have a, a complete prompt engineering uh, guide here. Um, and there are different things that you can uh, direct the model to use. So you can say, okay, this is a list of X, and then you give it a bullet point, and the model is is able to you know complete the the list for you. Um, one of the scary things when you a lot of people are are really surprised when they uh, interact with with these models, um, and it's very easy f to think that okay, this is an intelligent, a highly intelligent, intelligent like a human being um, uh, entity, um, and so it's important to not be fooled by how you know good the language that the model generates, um, and assume things that are not. Um, that the model is not really um, able to uh, to do. And really the test here is that you have to try it for a lot of things, but we know that there are a lot of flaws and risks in misusing uh, these models. And that, that's something where we should be sort of conscious about. Um, so you'll see a lot of examples of using these models to do interesting behavior, but then when you're talking about using them in industry or, or in, in business, um, the, the idea of, how can they rely, reliably generate good results? So not just, you know, um, give them, you know, 10, try, try, try them 10 times and, you know, four times out of 10, they give you, you know, a good result that you post on Twitter and you get a lot of uh, response. No, if you're going to roll it out into, into uh, you know, production or into industry, how can you reliably make sure that it successful for your task 80 or 90 or 95 percent of the time or that it's uh, you know when it fails that there are other um, uh, steps in your pipeline that capture that failure uh, so these are all, a lot of um, you know important areas about about the deployment of these models into um, and there are some you know tools that developed over time um, one of them is that you don't take the first result that the mod model gives you. Um, a lot of the times you will get better results if you have the model output, you know, five different, uh, let's say, outputs, and then you choose the best one for some definition of best. And there are a few, but a common one is the likelihood score. Uh, the likelihood score is this probability that the model gives you back when it returns the text. And so that's one way of, of trying to choose the best one. Um, and there are other metrics, right? So if you're paraphrasing, for example, um, you want to make sure that the uh, candidate that you want to pick is close enough, um, but not too similar to the input prompt, but also not, not too far away. Uh, so let's say you have, you have a, a sentence or an article that you want to paraphrase. Uh, if one of the candidates is the same, but only change some punctuation, that is too similar to the original. So you don't want that. Um, if it's some, saying something absolutely completely different, then that is too different and you don't want that one. And so you want something maybe in that in that range in the middle. Uh, and so you, you start to develop these, these tools of, of um, you know, what task are we trying to do? And then what uh, language modeling primitive can, primitives can we uh, use to, to, to solve this problem? There are a lot of interesting... 
and reliable, let's say, more reliable uh, use cases of generating synthetic data to create better kinds of models in classification. Uh, so this is Toxigen is one, um, one paper that uses uh, models that generate uh, synthetic data for uh, toxicity uh, and hate speech detection, uh, and they improve on, on, on existing models. Um, and you can see similar things with semantic search as well. So there is, uh, this is a paper called GenQ, and this is inparse, uh, and both are methods of creating better and better uh, neural search using generative models that generate synthetic data. So when you have a, a document, you generate questions, uh, and then use those questions to train a model to 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 improve its behavior. Um, yeah, and these are. I think, yeah, this is the final sort of uh, point in my um, short presentation. You know, quick summary is that we talked about these three use cases of, of large language models, classifiers, and neural or semantic search, and text generation models. Um, three high level ways to create, to build high performance text, classif text classifiers. You can use few shot um, examples uh, for uh, large language models. You can use the baseline embeddings with a simple classifier, kind of like a logistic regression or SPM, or you can fine tune and that's where you get the absolute best uh, model for your use case. Um, we touched on a few exam a few uh, main concepts. So embedding models turn text into a list of uh, numbers uh, or what we call a vector. And then these vectors can be compared uh, for similarity scores. And then we can also visualize them to see you know, which ones are similar uh, and similar points or text will be close to each other. And we talked a little bit about uh, text generation models and how to do them reliably to generate you know, multiple times. And uh, there's this whole field of, of, of prompt engineering. Um, and then there's this super important idea of fine tuning, which is continuing to train a model that was already pre-trained, um, and then that uh, enhances that model for, for a specific use case. Thank you so much for bearing with me. These are some links. Uh, this is the book that we discussed. Uh, that's my blog, my Twitter, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. Thank you for uh, listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jay, for the nice talk um, and, and the overview. Uh, I believe you've gone over very exciting topics and we'll see them in the questions. So let's get ready. Uh, I will uh, start by uh, Professor Ehab Ashar. Uh, so uh, Dr. Ehab, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay, for this is an exciting talk. It's, it's a really good overview. So uh, my experience in creating language model is just uh, from a cybersecurity perspective or I would say domain specific uh, language model. And uh, the issue here is actually it's most of existing language models are not very useful when it comes to cybersecurity. For example, uh, many of the semantic meaning is very different. So now, for example, kill, it, it means pause or, or, or terminate is, a, is, is different to, from uh, the, the, the regular language models. And uh, how to understand malicious actors or malicious actions uh, is, is different. So one big challenge we faced here, how we can, uh, and we, had a, we have a recent paper on this uh, issue, creating a domain specific language model for cybersecurity. But one of the challenges that we, we faced is the, is the training. So how we have to get lots of data labeled and this is very intensive labor task that was not easy to do. So from your perspective, and we went through many of this classification, text generation, but from cybersecurity text and, 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 and domain. So is there any, uh, from your experience, so my question, is there any work that you are aware of how we can do this uh, semi-supervised or, or unsupervised uh, techniques for uh, language model or if you have for, for domain specific? Uh, without requiring a huge crowdsourcing of uh, training and so on. Amazing. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so domain adaptation is a is a major uh, area where where people sort of have to uh, figure out what what to do. And 
you know the the toolbox there are a few tools in that in that toolbox that are of different uses um, in different use cases um, so fine tuning is definitely one area where a lot of these models have to uh, uh, have to undergo for them to do something something useful uh, so you know where where you know five years ago if we were to train a model we have to train it from scratch this idea now of transfer learning of taking something that's already pre-trained in a lot of text and then um, you know, fine tuning it on our, our new data set uh, is uh, is this paradigm that is um, useful and it depends on yeah do we need uh, labeled data or can we do it you know semi supervised uh, it depends on the end task but a lot of tasks can benefit from a, a, a semi supervised um let's say pre-training stage even if it's in the end it's going to be classification uh, showing the model a lot of examples and uh, semi-supervised and have it sort of just do you know predict the next token on it uh, tends to adapt the model to um, how words are used in that domain so when you say actors um, you know that has a, a specific meaning in this domain that is different from you know hollywood or, or film yes. reviews uh, mm -hmm. And so, just showing the model via language model, language modeling, or um, uh, masked language modeling uh, is is another one. And another sort of fine tuning model that is uh, or method that is used, especially for you know sentence or text uh, embedding, is this idea of contrastive training. So, if you have a lot of uh, examples of words that are similar, or let's say sentences that are similar, and other sentences that we know are not similar. Um, you know, we can uh, train the model to say, okay, make the sentence embeddings of these different and uh, of the ones that are not similar, make them um, far away from, from each other. So that's another, let's say, fine tuning uh, method in addition to language modeling, mask language modeling, and then this like, contrastive. Um, uh, but you see, in the, in the last example you mentioned, so uh, you need to have labels to say this, these are similar, these are not similar. So we, we did fine tuning for birds, but it's like we are redoing things from scratch because we have to do, we, we have to, you know, get all this millions of, uh, of text from different textbooks and redo the training all over again. And uh, it was not an easy task. And I know that many of the linguists who have done, gone through this, they hired lots of people to do this labeling. So I'm wondering if, if like in order to get a, uh, an accurate, uh, Understanding semantic understanding and role and semantic role labeling, uh, this is our goal. It, it, it seems to me that you know we are stuck with this uh, huge uh, effort of labeling. Uh, yeah. Fine tuning is something we, we did, but it's, it seems to me it, it, fine tuning you leverage what exi existing models right and 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 yeah. you extend it to something that. But this extension is is huge. This is uh, yeah. where I'm trying to see from your experience if there is anything helpful in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the semi-supervised example. I think is is you know where a lot of these methods are. So specifically for the mm. sentence similarity one, there's a method mm. called declutter that just you know takes documents and treats sentences that come after each other that are in the same document as similar, uh, and that gets it a lot of you know really good uh, results. So there mm. are these yeah mm. these these methods of things that you know if these two sentences. But this is more for not you know you know specific token, uh, but more you know on the sentence level or or text embedding. Um, when dealing with code, I don't know if you're talking specifically about just text or code, uh, but um, you know when dealing with code models, the tokenization a lot of the times has to be sort of tweaked as well. Um, and what the tokenization that is useful for uh, language or, or natural language and the one that is used for code. Uh, turns out to be a, a huge factor. Um, but yeah, every use case is, is different. And definitely data is, is always going to be the, the bottleneck for every use case. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahab, for your questions. I have a lineup of questions here. So let me start with uh, uh, Nora Treyev. Uh, she's saying that human uh, biases are reflected in the pre-trained language models. So how can we detect and miti uh, mitigate uh, the bias in NLP models? That is a huge area of research. Uh, it's an important factor to to consider and and know about. And it's one of the areas where uh, language models are you know are not advised for 
high stakes, um, uh, let's say, scenarios or use cases. So you don't want a language model that uh, is diagnosing people with diseases as a, you know, as a, as a healthcare chatbot. It can be, you know, part of a, of a system that says, okay, these, um, I don't know, symptoms match this description or something, but the model should not be doing high stakes decisions uh, without sort of, uh, you know, a human in the loop. So uh, a lot of it is is understanding where these models fail and sort of what kinds of biases that are known to be baked into them. Uh, and another one is just figuring out, you know, how to um, deploy them properly to make sure that the users are educated on on the, the, on the proper usage uh, and where these models, you know, tend to fail. Um, so these are all sort of, um, it's a super important area and beyond sort of, you know, the safe and responsible use of, of AI, the idea of researching more into interpreting these models and explaining them is also another area that is extremely um, important uh, and we need a lot more work on it in, in the coming years. Uh, thank you for your answer. Another question uh, we have, and it seems that the questions keep coming. So please, uh, if you uh, don't mind, use the Q and A uh, tab, and we'll try to address as as, uh, as many as we can, inshallah. Next question is from Dr. Barhan Saifuddin. Uh, who do you think will win the next search engine war? Microsoft, Google, Apple, or a new startup? So it's it's really I want. So a lot of people are going to win. Uh, I don't think it's going to be one company, one search engine, uh, and a lot of them are going to use a lot of the similar uh, techniques. Um, search is yeah one of the most interesting areas because people want to use these models directly for search. Um, and the one thing that my biggest, let's say, prediction that I'm certain of uh, for this year so since Chat, Chat GPT, we saw maybe five different other companies that were trying to do the same thing, and we've you know we've prototyped things and we open source code that does something similar to this. But the, the main idea is that uh, a Chat, a search GPT model should give you back, you know, where it found the piece of information, and not just give you a piece of information. Um, and so that domain of models is called um, retrieval augmented language models and it's one of the most interesting areas that i find sort of uh, uh, and i i predict there's going to be you know huge demand and, and rise for it and so is the search engine going to be the one that is serving the model or the one that is you know serving also the the documents in in the back end um you know it's very hard to 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 predict but the next version of search engines could be something completely different than what we've seen in the past. Um... <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I think the next one is might be a little bit relevant as well. Manara Sayed is asking, uh, well, thank you first for the excellent presentation. Uh, has uh, this uh, work been used or um, I believe referring to language model in general in specialized texts such as contracts, legal documents, uh, material and technical designs and things like that? Yes, absolutely. This is, uh, this is a lot of where a lot of these use cases are. There's the legal domain, uh, sometimes healthcare domain. These are, you know, very deep, deep uh, domains. Um, a lot of text is involved. A lot of language processing is involved. Um, you know, you have a lot of use cases where a, you know, a company wants to look back at all of their contracts um, and, you know, maybe they have thousands of, of contracts with different customers and some of them are a little bit different, uh, phrased in different ways. Uh, you know, in previous NLP technology, relying on just counting words or matching words is not usually enough. Um, and people in these, these domains are also faced with some very difficult uh, situation. So let's say the regulator changes some regulation in, in, in a policy, and then you need to go and check back versus, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of article of, of contracts or, or agreements that you have. Uh, does this change apply to all of these or not? So these are definitely domains where um, there's a massive demand for uh, next generation uh, language processing technology that can uh, help people with all of these uh, domains and their challenges. 
Great, thank you. Um, next question is from Dr. Ibrahim Al Hashim. Um, it's saying, excellent talk. What are the key challenges to transfer these models to Arabic at this time? Is it compute capacity or is it data for Arabic? Uh, or um, I may add, is it something yeah. else? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so Arabic is, is, is multiple things, right? So Arabic, there is modern standard Arabic, Fusha, that is our newspapers are written on. Uh, and you can train a model on those models, but then if you're a, a company doing, uh, you know, Twitter uh, chatbots for your customers, people write maybe in the local dialect, uh, either, uh, you know, of, of, of Riyadh or of uh, Shergia or... So Arabic has, you know, multiple challenges that a lot of, you know, the researchers here know a, a lot better than I do, but... Data is one thing that helped a lot with with um, uh, and it's not just the quantity of data, but also the quality of the of the data. Uh, so a lot of the recent developments uh, have a lot of active labeling uh, that happens of of uh, and just curating super high quality um, uh, clean data. Um, so uh, I would say one, additional um, variable that I think Arabic um, should be considered for is, okay, if we don't have enough text, clean, high quality text data, um, let's rely on, or let's use um, voice data as well. Um, and so I'm really excited specifically for Arabic um, on these multimodal models that we train on both text and you know all the podcasts that people are publishing, and all the all the all the voice data that we have, where people are speaking the way that they sort of speak. And so, um, I'm I'm really excited to see more and more Arabic multimodal voice and text. And I think these will really be the game changer uh, for, for 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 the Arabic language. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is from Fawaz, uh, saying, "What's the role of reinforcement learning in large language models uh, uh, space in general?" Yeah, reinforcement learning was very big at one point, and then it sort of NLP sort of took over. Uh, but there's a resurgence of of reinforcement learning with the massive GPT models, um, and specifically, it's a it's a concept called uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, that is the one that is most commonly used um, uh, at the moment, and it's kind of like when we said, uh, you know, you have one input to a language model, and you have maybe five outputs. Um, and the role of, of um, reinforcement learning from human feedback is to train, um, let's say, an agent to choose the best one and, you know, continue to train the language model uh, to be able to provide you with high quality generations. And that is a way that is very quickly improving uh, GPT models uh, over the last, you know, year or two. And maybe that's the biggest development that ChatGPT sort of um, demonstrated over the previous version of, of large GPT models that the industry and the research have seen. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next question is from Ahmed Al Muhammad. Uh, for diffusion models, like uh, uh, the popular stable diffusion, how will a large language model improve its performance for the best? So maybe this is a contrast between the video vision and NLP if possible. Yeah, so, so diffusion models, image generation models are creating images, but they use text, right? So you use a text input, a description or an image prompt to, to generate it. And the larger and the better the language model that you do is, uh, the better that the images generated are, the more humans prefer them. Um, I would refer you to the Imogen paper from Google where they tried, so for stable diffusion, for DALI, for all of these models, a language model is the first, is one of the first components of, you know, processing the input uh, prompt and translating it into a vector. And then that vector is used to generate the image. Um, and there's a, an experiment, an ablation that the Google image, image in paper showed of, you know, what if you swap a small language model or a large one? Um, does that change the quality and how humans prefer the, the generation of the model? And it turned out to have a much larger effect on how humans prefer the generated image than if you use larger, if you change the computer vision components uh, later on. So yeah, language modeling is, is super important for, for image generation and you know, audio generation and video generation, the, the other modalities that we'll see more and more this year. Great, thank you. 
do we still have uh, energy and room for some more questions as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So the next, next question, uh, I think the series of questions from Emma Ahmadi uh, related to that. Um, so uh, one question is, can you shed some light on how large models, uh, we're talking about multi-billion parameters, can be trained? Why do we need such number, uh, large number of parameters in uh, such models uh, in general? Yeah, so the amount of parameters that you give a model increase what's called the, the model's representational capacity. It's like the more that the model can understand about the world, the more the model can store and memorize about the world. Uh, but I'm really excited about smaller and smaller models. Um, so the size of model, we've seen 1 trillion uh, parameter models that are not as good as, as, as you know, a lot of smaller models. And we've seen... Um, you know, models that use other tricks, um, let's say, you know, this, this retro from DeepMind that was 4% the size of GPT-3, but it was comparable to it in, in specific tasks uh, because it was augmented with search or with a, a database that it can look at. Um, and so the size of the model is, is, let's say, one metric, but it's, it's a little bit um, of, a, of a misleading metric. Um, and it's it makes them also you know harder to deploy, harder to deal with. The inference speed is, it becomes so. I'm really excited about you know smaller and smaller models that are more performant that are you know fine tuned for a specific use case. Uh, but that's that's basically why they're sort of they're able to you know memorize and quote unquote learn uh, a lot of a lot of data um, and you know experimentally they've shown better results. Uh, Thank you. Uh, another related question as well. Uh, uh, is uh, Google Lambda uh, or LAMDA better than uh, GPT-3? Uh, uh, do you think that Google will release it publicly after releasing chat GPT? And then another question or another side of that question, what is the truth about uh, GPT-4? Does it have a trillion uh, parameters? Is it dense? Is it sparse? What are the pros and cons? cons of this dense and sparse model. So this is a multifold question <laughs> okay. uh, coming from the same, same, same uh, person. Yeah. Yeah. It's very hard to uh, compare models. There isn't a metric. Uh, there are many metrics, but there isn't one that, you know, tells you Lambda was a really impressive paper that came out. You know, not not many people outside of Google have, have experimented with it, but it really showed a lot of promise uh, in things like chat and things like tool use, which is this idea of giving your language model access to a calculator and giving your access model access to a you know search engine. They can go and search and, and do something. So it really, uh, it was a visionary uh, approach and in paper that uh, uh, it's part of, you know, Google's product policy, whether they release it or not, is it safe or not? There's a lot of responsibility uh, questions that, you know, if you're the incumbent, if you're the large company, that you have this, this responsibility that you, uh, you know, you can't really control a lot of, you know, the what the model is going to say. We've, you know, seen use cases of uh, very large companies creating models and people misusing them, which generates a lot of, um, you know, negative feedback on, on, on the company. And so, the responsible um, uh, release of these models is is something that the industry as a whole is, uh, but definitely, I mean, Google has, um, you know, some of the most interesting uh, work in the space. Uh, and so I'm really excited to see how they uh, augment that. I believe they have some, so they have something called uh, test kitchen. And I believe you can start to experiment with Lambda in that. Um, I haven't done so myself, but I think there are some previews um, and that would be the maybe one of the first places where people start to experiment with, with Lambda. And I, I assume people have started to already. Um, I don't have much to say about GPT-4, honestly. Uh, again, number of parameters is not really the biggest. Um, uh, there are different architectures where parameters mean different things um uh, but uh, i'm this domain really surprises you every few months so uh you know it's it's, it's always super exciting and uh, never a dull moment so but i'm really excited to also not for us to be consumers but to also create the next exciting things let's see what's what's been popular what's been useful let's create the next products ourselves now let's not just be you know consumers that look at what is hot out there what is the tech doing you know let's 
see, okay, maybe this applying this kind of model, let's say GPT 3.5 or, or Cohere's uh, large language model, we want to apply to this industry problem. And I'm a lot more excited about us being creators rather than just consumers of the tech. Right. Uh, I have two more questions before uh, we, we can give you a break on that. One question is uh, from Hussein. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, can a general domain language model properly vectorize CVs? Uh, I, I, I don't get the question. Uh, Python seems to be more like uh, lion-like than data-like. Uh, how to deal with such a case? Uh, and that, that's it. Um, so... Uh... Depends on how you want to vectorize them. So there's, you know, every use case you need to do, a, you know, some engineering at the end. Um, there are language models kind of like BERT that are not trained to do sentence embedding. There's another step after BERT or Roberta that is used to create, you know, proper uh, sentence embeddings. And so um, if you're looking for to represent one CV as one vector, you need a text uh, classific text embedding model, not a word or a token embedding model. Um, and you know, one of the best ways to get those. So Cohere offers a few of them. If you need, let's say, a managed uh, one, if you want to, you know, experiment with your own uh, ones, you can use something like sentence transformers. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, um, pre-trained text embedding models, uh, but. Uh, Again, in the end case, maybe you need to, uh, you know, fine tune it for a, your own specific use case. Because even for yeah, CVs, company A wants to do something different from, and I'm assuming you mean CVs as resumes, and you're doing a job uh, and applicant sort of uh, NLP tasks, not that it's computer vision or something else. So uh... right, right, uh, and uh, I will end with this uh, question uh, since you just spoke about uh, cohere. Uh, Dr. Burhan is asking, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Cohere, uh, missions and goals? And uh, this is more of a personal question, so uh, feel free not to answer it, but uh, say, why did you join the team? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to, to, to talk about this. So Cohere wants to make... Cohere was founded by uh, folks who left Google Brain, and one of them was one of, one of the authors of the original Transformers paper. And it's basically offers this API of transformers in the cloud. So just to make it very easy for everybody to use these models without having to, uh, you know, spend a month training your own large language model and getting 12 GPUs to, to deploy it on, you know, what if it's on the cloud and you as a developer, you just have a you know very simple access to send commands and get back useful uh, thing. So Koya's mission is just to make it accessible and, and usable for, for developers to use this next generation of, of language tools. Um, because, you know, large companies have armies of, of data engineering people and, and uh, uh, engineers that can do that. And, uh, you know, smaller companies need help. And so that's what we're sort of focused on. And I joined because, uh, you know, I love the team, but I'm absolutely fascinated about the space. And language models is all I think about you know, the last, you know, five or six years in my work day, in my weekends. Um, and so I want to be really close to it, not only because it's an interesting idea, but it, because it's also going to change so much of just economy of, you know, countries, economies of uh, company economics in ways that we don't understand yet. Um, and so I wanted to be really close to that, how that evolves, uh, evolves and that changes. Uh, because a little bit, you know, to give you an example, before that, I was in, in um, venture capital uh, for about seven years. And uh, you see that, you know, a, an idea can change the economy in eight years. So iPhone comes out in 2007. That leads to things like Kareem and Uber. And then every taxi company feels the pressure in, in, in Saudi Arabia, let's say, in, in, in eight years of, of iPhone coming out. And so these technolo technological developments... Um, lead to a lot of economic change then I and I'm extremely interested in that uh, and seeing how that develops um, so yeah that's that's my personal sort of uh, interest in, in the area. Great. great thank you thank you uh, for for your patience and answering the questions I mean this is a, I would say one of the longest sessions for Q and a and I'm thankful that now you when you told me earlier that the the president presentation is on the shorter side. I was excited for this Q&A, and I'm glad we got all these questions uh, uh, on a wide spectrum, I would say, of uh, NLP and even on, on, on a personal level. Uh, again, on behalf of, of, of 
of KFUPM on behalf of everyone who attended today. I would uh, really thank uh, our speaker, Jay Lamar, for accepting our invite and joining us for this exciting uh, talk. And I hope uh, that we will uh, uh, invite you again, or we'll have you again for another talk. Uh, and uh, hopefully that one will be technical. It seems that we have a lot of the audience from NLP, so we'll go dive deeper uh, into the NLP models uh, or, or do something, uh, I would say, a little bit on the uh, uh, deeper side. But thank you very much. I appreciate your, appreciate your time, uh, the overview uh, uh, in, in general, uh, and thank you for answering uh, our questions. Uh, with that, I would like to thank also and extend the uh, thanks to all our audience who joined us today. Uh, most of our students here who, um, despite the busy schedules of the final exams, I wish you all the best uh, joined us today. Uh, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you so much. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum.